Brightline, America's shiny new privately owned passenger rail service. Perhaps the US is finally making its way back to the golden age of rail travel, where the private sector will once again provide us with gleaming new self-sustaining passenger train service. When Brightline first launched, news stories were full of optimism about how ridership would explode and the new trains would become the first profitable passenger trains in almost a century. But these days, headlines are looking more like this, with statistics about low ridership and massive operating losses. But despite these grim headlines, Brightline is more than likely a huge success, raking in the cash left and right. Here's what most articles about Brightline overlook. And it's not a new story either. Let's explore what's really going on and travel back in time to examine two other railroads that might give us a clue into how Brightline actually makes its money and where things might be headed in the future. In 1971, Amtrak was created to take the money-losing passenger service off the hands of almost every major American rail company. Passenger trains were so unprofitable that these corporations were eager to get rid of them as soon as possible. But will Brightline finally be able to accomplish what none of these companies ever could? Run a profitable passenger train? In my opinion, probably not. But that's not the point. Brightline loves to publicly tout just how fiercely private their operation is, including all of their investment in new infrastructure. But let's travel back to 1903 to look at how one of the most famous US railroads in history completed a truly massive infrastructure project with absolutely no public funding. The New York Central Railroad and the Palatial Grand Central Terminal. Construction started in 1903 and lasted 10 years, costing an estimated $180 million, more than $5.5 billion today. But even the mighty New York Central and all its partner railroads couldn't shoulder this huge burden based on passenger ticket revenue alone. So how did they do it? Real Estate A major part of the Grand Central construction project was the complete redevelopment of Park Avenue from 42nd Street all the way up to 91st. When you're standing on Park Avenue today, you're not actually standing on solid ground. The road, the sidewalk, and most of the buildings are all sitting on top of a bridge over the tracks. If you know where to look, you can even find expansion joints for this bridge around Grand Central. As New York City burgeoned with vertical expansion, the concept of air rights became increasingly valuable. The New York Central recognized this potential of selling the space above Park Avenue for commercial development. This pioneering move allowed the railroad to generate substantial revenue by essentially selling the rights to build upwards, a concept that laid the groundwork for future urban development projects worldwide. This serves as a perfect example of a railroad profiting from something other than hauling passengers and freight. They made money from their real estate. And this brings us to our second historical example that might better guide our understanding of Brightline. Another railroad mogul took things a step further by using the railroad and its operations to directly increase the revenue and value of his real estate ventures. His name was Henry Flagler. Flagler first made his mark in business as one of the founders of Standard Oil, alongside John D. Rockefeller. However, it was his ventures in Florida that would solidify his legacy. In the 1880s, Flagler turned his attention southward, recognizing the untapped potential of Florida's coastal regions. He embarked on an ambitious project to develop Florida's east coast, envisioning a network of luxurious resorts and efficient transportation systems that would transform the state into a tourist destination. Flagler's most renowned achievement was the construction of the Florida East Coast Railway, stretching from Jacksonville to Key West, Florida. The railway opened up previously inaccessible areas of Florida to development and tourism. Alongside the railway, Flagler built lavish hotels, attracting wealthy tourists from across the country. Effectively, he built the railroad to funnel passengers from the north directly into his business ventures in the south. The trains brought customers and made his real estate holdings more valuable and accessible, thus increasing his fortune far more than he ever could have through railway ticket sales alone. Back to Brightline. While much of the media focuses on ridership and ticket revenue, 
they miss the forest for the trees. Enter Fortress Investment Group, which acquired Florida East Coast Industries and the Florida East Coast Railroad in 2007. Then in 2018, Fortress Investment Group purchased Brightline, which was then known as All Aboard Florida. They recognized the potential for high-speed rail to reshape transportation in the Sunshine State. While offering passenger service is the most visible business activity, that's not how Fortress makes its real money. As the trains bring in customers, as well as make the areas more attractive to those wanting access to transit, Brightline directly increases the property values and revenue potential of Fortress's real estate holdings. Perhaps one of the biggest examples of this are the twin apartment buildings atop Miami Central Station. Known as the Parkline Apartments, they were constructed by Florida East Coast Industries, which is owned by Fortress. Because the rail service had increased the real estate value so much, they sold the two apartment towers to Harbor Group International for over $400 million in 2022. Fortress further cashes in on their real estate holdings by leasing space in their stations and other nearby buildings for office space, restaurants, and retail, further diversifying their income stream. In early 2024, Brightline announced the construction of two more stations along their line in Cocoa and Stewart, Florida. Both of these stations are still in the planning process. And according to several local reports, Fortress is snapping up real estate near these new stations with expectations that the property values will skyrocket. This is exactly what Fortress did in the past when they sold two vacant plots of land that they owned near the Fort Lauderdale station for over $37 million. But eventually, there will most likely come an end to all of this so-called transit-oriented development, just like it did for the New York Central and Henry Flagler before. And one day in the future, there will no longer be millions to be made from creating new hotspots around Brightline stations. The market will have become saturated and growth will stall. At that point, the main revenue stream will become the operations of the trains themselves. Can this ever be profitable? If recent Brightline earnings reports and the history of American passenger trains are to guide our understanding, probably not. So what then? If history repeats itself, Sooner or later, real estate development opportunities will be less abundant, and the need to reinvest in rail infrastructure will become a reality. But by that point, new urban centers dependent on Brightline will have been well established, and shutting down rail service would be almost unthinkable. So the government might be forced to step in, and what we would have is yet another version of Amtrak, a quasi-government agency providing a vital service to the community with taxpayer dollars instead of through private industry. But this might not be a bad thing. Even if Brightline ends up becoming a public service, there is an argument to be made that it never would have gotten built without private enterprise in the first place. What do you think? Is Brightline just a means to an end in this juggernaut of a real estate portfolio? Is it destined to eventually outlive its potential? Or could privately owned self-supporting passenger trains actually make a real comeback in America? I'll be looking forward to your comments. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Rail Weekly. And for more rail fanning action, check out this video next. Please like and subscribe to support the channel, and I'll see you next time.